traveling and um, working at the same time in animation and um, I was I was 20 something at the time I didn't I didn't expect to stay that long <laughs> so I guess I'm still traveling but I, I've been here half of my life so I'm, I'm based in Montpellier in the south of France yeah. you didn't expect to stay there for that long well, it, was, it was the ship because I was working in Montreal and the company uh, they had a problem with the production so they just stopped the production and um, so I was out of job and I thought well I'll, I'll travel like lots of uh, Canadians and French Canadians go to Europe, uh, visit the old countries, and uh, I got a job in a in in a animation studio um, in Germany, and then I worked uh, a bit here and there. There was studio all over Europe at that time. It was it was it was very easy to find work. So um, I said, well, I'm going to try France, and uh, and I I tried a few studios, a few cities, and. Uh, and then I stayed longer than I thought because I thought I would, you know, just travel and come back home. But uh, I, I never came back home, basically. How has France been handling the pandemic over the past year? Uh, it, um, I still have my family in Quebec and I talk with them. And um, it's it's kind of the same now. There was a curfew, but now it's at 11. Um, terrace are open and in, inside restaurants are open since this week. So it's kind of the same pace as Canada, I think. You're not quite there, but slowly, slowly getting there. Yeah, yeah. No, we we don't have to wear a mask on the streets anymore. So it looks like a back to the good old days. Have you been doing animation work in the meantime? Well, I stopped animation work after after Pyongyang. Actually, that was my last because uh, I thought, well, I'm just gonna try to focus on my work. Uh, doing comic books and um, and I did Pyongyang right uh, and um, and Pyongyang worked uh, quite well so I thought well I'm, I'm just gonna continue working on uh, on comic books and um, so I never went back to animation because for me animation it was um, it was supervising work uh, outsourcing and all that uh, you have to be very um, flexible uh, I mean in terms of uh, if you have a family it's you go away so yeah I was I was happy to have a, a steady place and job to do uh. yeah I find that's a case with a lot of jobs that are peripherally related to something creative you know I assume that your what initially drew you to animation as an industry is obviously you're a storyteller you're somebody who likes to, to draw but if you stick at it for long enough you get promoted and you kind of get promoted out of that thing that you wanted to do in the first place. I'm not so sure because animation, it's a long chain of, of artistic work. And I think the best way is to do comic books and have an adaptation. And then you say, okay, I'll work on the adaptation. But to go and, and go up the ladder and end up doing a, you can be a director. But to do your own stuff, hmm, I'm not so sure because you, you're not going to be seen as the creative guy. You're going to adapt a book. You're going to take someone's um, scenarios, storyboard. But uh, I don't see it like that. I think I've had offers for animation of my books um, a few times. And I thought, well, you know, <laughs> this is what I was. That's the way I was seeing it, actually. Uh you do you do some creative work and people in the studio uh, animation studio sees it and says oh you know that would be an interesting adaptation and they and they do it did you accept the operas ultimately and they just didn't pan out or were they just not the right fit uh there was a, a bit of both um, um someone wanted to do um the, my traveling books they wanted to do the jerusalem book and I said no. Same for the Burmese book. I said I know I don't want to. I don't want to see that because uh, well, ultimately it's going to be me talking in the film. So I have two choices: either I, I let it uh, go and someone else take care of it, and there's going to be a very big surprise. I'm sure. I'm sure. And since I'm I'm going to be in the film talking, that's problematic. And um, I'm not ready to quit uh, doing comic books and focus on a film for four, five, six years because these things take a long time uh, and then at the end you have one film and that's it and uh, if it works good, well, that's okay if it's a success, well, it's great but uh, most probably it's just going to be another film 
and that's it. I prefer to do a book. I prefer to do uh, six books in, well, three books in six years than just one movie. <laughs> Even if you are put in a situation where you're allowed to have continued creative control over the product, you still have to give up a lot of control. And there's nothing, there are very few mediums in the world that let you micromanage in the way that you can with comics and animation. I mean, you know, this as well as anybody animation, you know, you're working with probably hundreds of people to get it done. So you kind of have to give away a piece of yourself. Oh yeah. It's a, it's a process of adaptation. It's a, it's a bit like when you have an idea, you think, oh, this could be an interesting book. And then you start working on the book and the idea has to be formed on, on drawings and, um, and text and letters and all that and and it's it's different so you have to kind of um, go as it goes and try to do the best uh it would be the same for animation of course you have so many people drawings they all they don't all draw your style and you have to make artistic decisions all the time that you are not you know totally satisfied and at the end you know it can be good but uh, it's going to be different, different than what you have. So that's the whole thing with adaptation. Uh, when you do comic book, um, what I like is that you have a lot of freedom. Uh, if if I want to do a science fiction book, I can start tomorrow, and uh, and uh, and that's it. I can I can do the book and then send it to some publishers if they're interested. But uh, animation, well, you need a team, and before you're going to start on your book uh, on your animation. Uh, you have to convince producer that it's a good idea, and you spend so much energy on on stuff that are not going to be in the creative thing, like movie. I mean, if you, when you do a storyboard, you do lots of stuff, and that's not really in the movie. Same with layouts. But when you do comic books, it's so efficient because you. I mean, today I worked. I, I did half a page. I mean, I did sketch and then I ink, and everything is going to be in the book basically. Uh, there's, there's not a lot of waste that uh, really like that. In North America, you've had a very good relationship with Drawn and Quarterly. They put out, if not all, mo most of your books, most of the ones at least that, that have gotten English translations. But is the process of writing a book, is, is it as you described from the standpoint of really sitting down and working on something in its entirety before you're entirely sure who's going to publish it? Well, it was like that at the beginning, but now, uh, yeah, I know that John and Carter Lee is, is going to be interested by any books that I'm going to work on, and they're going to decide if they take it or not. Uh, if it's a traveling book, of course, everybody's interested because they, they work quite well. There was that book about the guy who was kidnapped. It was different, but then... Um, I guess they saw the reaction in France and they, or they liked the idea and, and they translated it. So yeah, now I, I, I'm in a situation, same for France, when I, I have publisher who phones me once in a while and they say, so what are you up to? They're really interested in what I'm working on because they want to, they want to grab it first or they want to say, oh, you know, that, that's exactly the type of book we'd like to publish. <laughs> so I have that type of, uh, of of offer. And so it's very different than from the beginning where you, you hope some publisher is going to read it and they're going to have some interest in it. Uh, now it's it's very comfortable because I, I can even take time because when you have a publisher said, yeah, okay, it's good. I, I want to do the book and uh, it, it would be perfect if you can finish it for uh, September. And then you have to rush <laughs> because uh, because you have to finish it for September. So and now I'm usually I, I go and I'm I'm halfway done in a book and I haven't I haven't talked to my publisher about it. Uh, uh, same when I was working on the on, on the kidnap guy uh, hostage book. Um, I think I did 200 pages and then I said, you know, I'm working on that kidnap book guide that I wanted to do for a long time. And I, I spent more than a year. So for you one year, I had the, the very big luxury of not telling anyone and uh, no publisher was knowing that I was working on that. And then I said, I'm doing that. Well, they were all excited and they said, well, it's be great if you can do it for Angoulême in January. <laughs> I had to speed to finish the book. As you alluded to before the travel books have been i think you called them surefire hits from the standpoint of you know you've, you've done several of them and it's the thing that you're best known for were you a little nervous to step outside of that with the hostage book knowing that you've got this 
thing that you're known for? Well, um, but before the hostage, between that, there was, uh, you know, the the bad um, the, the bad dad guide. Well, in French, they say le guide du mauvais père, so it's the bad dad guide. Uh, so I did four of that. And um, it's funny because I thought, well, I'm just going to do these books, but they've been very popular in France. And a lot of people don't know that uh, it's the same person who do these traveling books and do the, the thing with the father who's not so good with the kids and try to do his best and all that. Um, so that comforted me. I said, well, you know, I can, <laughs> I, it, I, I sold a hundred thousand books in France of the first of that bad, that guy, which is very incredible. Um, I don't know. For some reason, I had good cover, good critics and the people just, just bought it like crazy. Um, not the one after because, uh, like a series, it goes slower after. But then I said, well, okay, now, um, after these s- small books, uh, I'm ready to work on something very big because I knew it would be a lot of page. And, um, so it's like a marathon. You have to be, you have to be ready. And, um, so I started and I spent like two years and something doing the, the, the book. But no, it was a good time for me to do that. Yeah, I was very happy because I was always wanted to do it. And, uh, there was always that we were traveling. I would come back and, they would I would postpone the, that project again and again and again. So yeah, I was really glad to be able to work on that. And I thought to myself, well, after 15 years, if, if you still think it's a good idea, hmm, I think it's time to really try to do it. And if it doesn't work, well, you have to forget about it. <laughs> what was it about that idea that stuck around, that stuck with you for 15 years? Well, it's it's going to be the most. Um, incredible story that someone has told me directly um, and well not exactly but it's it's one incredible story that I can relate to because I've had when you work with people that have been on the field with Doctors Without Borders well you can imagine they all has very action stories and dramatic stories and uh, but um, I'm not a doctor I'm never going to be in situations like that but to be kidnapped, it's something, you know, it, it can happen to anyone if you're in the bad place at the bad moment. Uh, you can be in Mexico and Colombia and Philippines. Well, he was in Chechnya, of course. And um, when he told me that story uh, in a restaurant 15 years ago and I was listening to it, I thought, wow, this is what, what an incredible human experience. I mean, to be deprived of your basic rights, which is freedom. Like it, it, every decision he was making was... Every decision was 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 done by someone else, like uh, to go to the toilet, to read, to whatever. Anything was by someone else. So how frustrating can that be? I, I've always thought, yeah, what would I do in a situation like that? And um, well, there's no really answer to that uh, because, like Christophe was saying to me, um, in a situation like that, you're a, a person, you're a different person. The stress is so high. He says, when I read the book, I can't imagine I've done that. It's it's actually quite crazy because I, I could have been shot. I should have just stayed there and wait for the for the ending. But of course, he was super happy to to escape. And yeah, the the, the captive story is is was very was very intense when he told me that. And uh, and since he escaped, I mean, that's the best story you can imagine for. A situation like that when when you're kidnapped like he told me the best therapy for a kidnapping is to escape because after two three weeks when he came back he went back to doctors without border and he told them well you know um, i'm ready for another mission uh, just send me somewhere and uh, they were all very surprised and they said okay we'll send you in a very quiet place so he he ended up working in in lao laos for a year and a half uh, in, in that small town Buddhist place. And you really enjoyed it. Yeah. Did that feel like a collaborative book in a sense? Uh, did you call him up and tell him you're working on this? Did you work closely to get that book written? We worked closely, but it was not a collaboration because um, I recorded him uh, long hours, very long hours. And I worked with these tapes that I had from 15 years before when his memory was still fresh because I think I recorded him when he was um, six months yeah, after that, that story, six months after. So it was still fresh in his memory. Uh, it was good because um, after 15 years, he, he said, well, I don't know if, if I say it on the tapes, then, it, then it's good. You had the tapes for 15 years that you used to base the book off. Yeah, so 
he was telling me if I say it in the tape, then it's probably the good thing because uh, after 15 years he was losing a bit uh, of, of the, some of the details. And um, well, he became a friend, but um, it, it was not a collaboration in the sense that I sent him the the page and he would read them, and there was not a lot of things to change, it's just some words here and there, but no details. And I did, you know, I did the whole thing, the whole plan, the whole chronological order and I had to put words in his mouth because I said well okay if he was in that situation uh, with this happening and this happening he was probably thinking that then I was writing them and I thought well he's gonna he's gonna change lots of things but no he just said you know I think you got it and after a while he was just reading the page and there was no almost no change there the other thing is he's, he's a bit like me he's kind of a shy guy and uh He's not, we're not very different, so that's why I guess I, it was easy for me to like step in his shoes and uh, just write words that he has probably thought or said. And um, it was a very interesting experience. That nonfiction storytelling, is that something not non-autobiographical, non-memoir? Is that something that you would like to go back to at some point? Mm, why not? Because uh, it was an interesting experience, but... Um, after that book, I've had people who were sending me a manuscript, or uh, they would they would pitch me their life and saying, you know, we should make a comic book about that, <laughs> which is very cute. And um, but sometimes, yeah, I had all, all sorts of stories, but I'm I'm actually not interested. I think yeah, I've, because this subject was appealing to me. And then I met Christophe, and it was just like the most interesting story of that kind. And that's it. Other than that, I, I don't see what would interest me. No, but I, I would like to work on some stuff that is biographical, uh, on someone else's life, like uh, a writer, a painter, a poet, a scientist. Uh, I've, I've worked a bit on that just uh, because I was thinking of that. Uh, an art dealer, actually, and uh, yeah, and I would like to make um, some biography material with that. Um, maybe not the whole life, maybe just a period or something like that. But uh, it it would be interesting. I like to I like to work with boundaries. So when it's my story, it's easy because I have my notes and these are the boundaries. On a biography, well, it's someone else's life, so you have to in that frame um, do something interesting to read and uh, I prefer that than having a, just a total open space of freedom and fiction yeah I appreciate that approach to biography as well because I think too often people's impulse when taking on a subject is to attempt to smash an entire life into a single book and you know we call them cliff's notes it's the sort of like the the bird's eye view, and you lose a lot of the really important details. Yes, I've read a really interesting book about uh, uh, Ravel, the piano player, and it was just on his 10th uh, last year before he died, when he was very famous and he went to America, uh, and he would lose his mind slowly. And uh, I like that, because I, I don't know his youth, what he looked like, but the book is just focusing on that. And it's very interesting. I like that. I read the last part of a three volume book on Churchill because to me, mm -hmm. the late years and, and the decline, that's always the most interesting part of the story to me. And there was that movie about Churchill. Uh, Darkest Hour. Yeah, right. Just on one very small uh, historical uh, event detail before the war. And that was very interesting. To some degree, there's a certain amount of similarity between stories when it comes to the early years, but um, it's that lived history that you get with somebody. It's what somebody does after they've hit their peak that really, you know, interests me. I'm, I'm as, as somebody who interviews people for a large part of my job, if I'm interviewing a musician, for example, I'd much rather interview the musician who has had that success and is on the other side versus the person who hasn't seen it all and it's just coming up mm. so you're you're for, you're for the decline part of the story i'm not entirely sure why but i just think it's a more interesting story to tell ultimately yeah well the way for me it goes it's uh i read well we all see these characters uh, historical characters and you think wow this is 
this is such a crazy life that uh, we think hey, it would be interesting to put that into a, a movie, a book, uh, or a comic book. And yeah, um, and just like that, I read sometimes stuff I hear about characters and I say, well, you know, I should work on that and try. Yeah, but it's a long process because you have to, um, well, if I make a book on someone, I want to read everything that he has that I can make uh, for, from, from the character that's being written on him. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a long process. You need to understand the context of the early years in order to write about the later years. You need you do need to know where this person went from point A to point B in order to really effectively write about point C. Yeah, I'm sure. Then you know you know him very well, so you know why he's reacting like that and uh, and why he's going in that direction. Yeah. Perhaps somewhat jokingly, I'm not sure, but you threw out science fiction as a hypothetical, you know, in terms of, a, you know, the book that you would write next. Is there any truth to that? If not science fiction specifically, then doing something that is really just completely outside of your comfort zone? I'm doing a bit of that now because uh, I'm, I was working on different projects and then some friend who, um, it's actually Louis Trondheim. Is, he lives here in Montpellier, and uh, he has a series called Dungeon. So I'm making a dungeon because they have uh, one of the series where they have lots of guests. And uh, I said, you know, someday I'd like to try one. And he had one ready, but someone couldn't do it. So I, he said, you know, uh, why not? So at first I, I said, okay, pitch me the whole story. <laughs> that was very funny. And um, I've read... Uh, I've, I've reread some of them to know where I was in that because it's very big now. It's I think they have 50 books, so I have to fit between two books kind of. And um, uh, so I'm I'm drawing. It's a cemetery, and you have uh, dead people and alive people that go to school together, and uh, all sorts of characters like that. And as it's first. The first days I regret. I said, "Why am I doing that?" I mean, it's gonna be so much, so much. I didn't get the whole thing. I was a bit confused, yeah, and so much work somehow. And I didn't know how to handle that. And it's exactly why I accept to put myself in a situation a bit different, in a different kind of drawing. But then I've always liked this type of of of, sto- of comic books when I was young, so. Uh, after a few days, I was just having fun, and I'm still having fun. I'm 15 pages done, and I'm, I'm, yeah, it's a lot of fun to do. So that's the first time I'm not doing the scenario. But I can help it. Every three days, I go to Lewis' place, and I have all these notes on the story. I said, wouldn't that be better if this and this happened instead of this? And I have that dialogue instead of that. But he's very flexible, so he says, uh, let's see, and then he says, Yes, no, yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, and so I get to have uh, the uh, an option for the story. I can I can put my grain of salt in it. You're working directly off of the script that Lewis wrote. That's right. There 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 are two actually. It's Lewis and uh, Jean Sfa, which are which are two of the most prolific writers uh, of comic books in France. Uh, they're, they're, they're two big machines. So it's interesting to see how they work actually and, and see how they work together to do that and how I can adjust. So yeah, because it's such a big machine. <laughs> it's interesting. Now that you're enjoying it and, and you're able to reflect on those early days, what was it that made it so difficult early on to start the project? Um, I, f- I found the story a bit confusing. Uh, I didn't, I didn't have all the character in mind because uh, Lewis was pitching the story. He said, you know, the red dog and all these characters. I didn't know them. Uh, so, but then I, I, I read the book and then I got, I got the whole thing and I just started with the first page and I thought, uh, my God, this is difficult. And I don't know, after the second day, uh, just the kind of cartoony drawing came back a bit like I was... I thought it was exactly like a, an animation project where you have new characters and it's a new world completely. You have to adjust. You need one or two days to start, try to get the characters and boom, you start to work. It was a bit like that. Ultimately, is it nice being able to do that, being able to sort of just focus on art? 
yes, it is a lot of fun. I'm really enjoying it. And, um, and I see myself, uh, doing stuff that I didn't know I would, I was, it would be so easy to do. I mean, I, I can have a class of kids, uh, catching someone because they want to eat that character and I can fit that in a little square and the f uh, I don't find it very difficult and uh, I'm just enjoying the experience I've accumulated after after so many years of doing um, comics but this one is in a so it's working on a genre so it's a, it's a very it's a very fun thing to do I would be ready to to do science fiction tomorrow, I would be ready to do um, a western. I think after doing that, uh, and and this is great because now I think after that my project are going to be, uh, I, my range is going to be wider some way, and the way they write is much more concentrated than I do, and I see well it works, and so it's interesting to work on someone else, on, on with someone else material scenario because that's. I don't work like that, but I get to work like that with them. So um, I get the stuff, and I think, wow, that's interesting. You can you can very quickly go to, from this to this, and uh, <laughs> all sorts of things. Concentrated in the sense that the the pacing is faster. Yeah, because it's forty six page, and they put a lot of text. I don't do that. I I I, tr I tend to very take my time, deal with stuff. And it fits with the stories I, I do, yeah. But for them, it has to go faster because lots of things happen. So uh, and it works. So I thought, oh, you know, it's, it's true that you can you can accelerate time, and uh, it's okay. Uh, yeah. So I'm learning a lot. It's fun. When I think about their art, when I think about their pages, they're they're heavily detailed in in a way that you know I I don't tend to 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 think of your work. Trondheim specifically doing a lot of really busy images of crowds uh, as far just very heavily detailed. Do you think that part of the sort of the initial disconnect there is that when they write, they tend to sort of write for them themselves as artists? Uh, yeah, most probably. But I remember Lewis told me, uh, he said, uh, you know, in the drawings, you have to put lots of details. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'll try. And uh, that's what I do, actually, because I have no choice. It happens in a cemetery where everything is just upside down and confusing. And you have a class of people with teacher. And so there is a lot of characters. Uh, you don't put all of them into one frame, but uh, uh, it's very busy. Um uh, it's going to be quieter in the second part, but that's okay. That's it's it's interesting to do as well. Yeah. I also tend to think of, of you as having a very defined style. Obviously, it, it varies from from book to book. Hostage wasn't the same as Pyongyang, for example. But you know, it's it's clear when I look at most of your work that it is your work. When we do finally see these pages, are they going to be a stylistic departure from what we've seen from you thus far? Oh, there's an adjustment, yeah, because I do much more um, shadows and uh, and and uh, and it's I don't do the color, but uh, it happens. Some of the stuff happens at night, so I really have to uh, to put some shadow that I draw in black, and um, and that's interesting. I really like do that because I've never done that before. But yeah, there's going to be a change, yeah. Uh, but after that, for my other project, I don't think so. Because if I would have to do hostage again, there was an image that uh, it, it had to be. I, I've tried different things, but then just a sim simple drawing that looked more like a sketch. Uh, that that's what I, I saw. Every book's kind of uh, imposed uh, a, a drawing. And if I do, if I would do another traveling book, I would just go back to that style because that style uh, is a bit funny. It's a bit graphic. And it's just perfect for tell stories that I have to tell, yeah. But uh, yeah, if I would do a science fiction book, then of course I would do something different. Is the story that Factory Summers is based on, is that another thing that you were sitting on for a number of years? Oh yeah, yeah. I've, I've been thinking of that for, um, well, the longest time because uh, once in a while, uh, one memory of that time was popping in my mind and... Uh, there was some very funny situation there, and I thought, well, you know, that would be an interesting uh, little part of a book if I ever do a book about that, and then I would just let go. 
but they would they would come always and uh, one day I thought well okay let's let's try to see uh, if I make a book what can I put in that and I just start to to note my my memories of that specific time and uh, even though I don't have a good memory I was very surprised that uh, wow all these things came back and came out <laughs> and uh, for a week they would just come and say oh yeah there was this and then oh yeah there was this so I note everything and then I realized well I think I have enough material to do a book and I just started the whole thing and uh, while I was working on the book uh, even till the end the book was finished all the pages were done and that's it and then I was shaving and I saw that I have that little scar here on the forehead and I thought oh that happened in the factory actually because I was Bing, and then I knocked myself and it started bleeding. I said, oh, I have to put that in the book. So I, I called the publisher. I said, I have still one more page to add. And she said, oh, we have to show this. Yeah, yeah, I have to put that in the book. And yeah, we I add that one. Yeah, a memory is an interesting thing. I have a bad memory as well. But I'm curious what the process was like. You found that you just sort of one day sat down, started to write, and then the pieces started connecting to one another? Yeah, that's right. I said, what would be interesting to put in the book? He said, uh, well, of course, that, that big guy uh, was doing a, a mark uh, who wanted to be a weightlifter or something like that. Uh, so that was just the mentioning of him. But then I said, oh, I remember that he helped me when we had uh, and then one thing would come, there would be three subjects out of that. And then there was the guy who was walking with his belly like that. <laughs> the shirt open. Yeah, the shirt open, it tied down. And I said, yeah, and they were all come back like that. Uh, uh, the guy who was selling his, his motorcycle <laughs> with like a lottery ticket. And uh, I I don't have a good memory. That's funny. But um, I guess when you're 17 and you're, that was my first summer job. And you're with these guys who live there, basically, and you're just for the summer, you know, they don't, they, they talk with you and uh, all that, but uh, you're just a student that, that's going to pass by. So they, they kind of ignore you. And uh, so, yeah, it's a bit intimidating. I, I was, I was kind of shy at 17 and uh, uh, the students, they would bring books and read. <laughs> I know I've, I've done that quite a lot while I was there. And um, so it was a very interesting place to read a book in a pulp and paper factory, which add to a souvenir because I remember reading a book and I was reading of Mouse and Men and I start to cry. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's a funny one that I, I took note like that. And uh, they all came within a week or two, basically. It did jump out at me that you're reading of Mice and Men because of Mice and Men, like a, a lot, really most of Steinbeck's work is a very blue collar book you know it's a book about working class people he's somebody who wrote a lot about you know grapes of wrath is a book about the depression the dust bowl obviously there's a disconnect uh, in a certain sense from you and the people working there in that as you said you were just kind of a, a visitor so intellectually what was that experience like of reading this blue collar book in the middle of this factory yeah, I've, I've read uh, 100 Years of Solitude as well while I was there. really enjoyed that one. Uh, of Mice of Men is, is a super popular book in the French, in, in the French countries. I, I read it in Quebec and uh, my daughter read the book uh, in, in a French translation just last year. She's 14. And, um, so it's, it's one of the books you read when you're young, I guess. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's, it's a very beautiful book. And I remember, well, they didn't mind. I mean, these workers, they would see students and uh, uh, I would say half of the students there, they would bring a book and read because all uh, well, the job was boring whenever you had time and you would bring a book. Uh, I guess some of them would, would bring books that they had to study during summer because uh, a lot of them were uh, study uh, to be doctor or lawyer. <laughs> and when I told these guys that uh, I, was, I was in fine arts, well, I, I could see the the gap between my world and their world, even though my world was not made up. And I, they told me, what do you want to do with fine arts? I didn't know. I was just hoping that if I can find, I said, I like drawing. If I can 
if I can be near the drawing process of something, you know, that'd be fun as a job. And uh, yeah, it's interesting to be in a factory when you're 17 because you look at that and you think, wow, you know, that's a possibility for a job. <laughs> Some people do that all their life. And um, I said, well, you know, I hope uh, my animation studies are going <laughs> to are gonna help me get the, get out of here. There's a moment in the book where it's very clear that they just have no way of contextualizing that, that, that that's something that somebody would not only want to do, but that that animation is something that somebody possibly could pursue as a livelihood. Yeah, I think if I would have told them I... I come from another planet, it would be the same reaction because for, I mean, they've never been in a museum. Most of these guys, um, they have no idea what the, some move, painting movement. So I was really into that when I was 17. Uh, and, uh, so yeah, very different, but it's, it, it's interesting to be there when you're 17. So you get to see, okay, worker, worker guys are, are like this. And I was trying in the book, uh, to portray them as I've perceived them when I was at that age. Um, some of them were very interesting, uh, and um, I, I, I've tried to put them in the book, not to balance things, but uh, that's how I've perceived them. S some of them were, you know, just one or two guys who were kind of assholes, but uh, most of them, they were just, uh, they were curious. I, I, I should have put that in the book maybe, but they would ask me questions about animation, I did a bit, and I said, you know, they, they, we, we have computers now to work on with that. And uh, I remember that when you mentioned computers, especially at that time, you know, it was the future. So they thought, oh, yeah, that's a good job. And uh, that's it. It, it was great. It was interesting to see that. Yeah. <laughs> Mark was an interesting character, the, the bodybuilder, because he, it seemed like he extended a kindness to you that few other Coworkers did. He was a he was a very nice guy. Uh, he helped me out, and he was the only one doing that. He very muscular, but he would ask questions. He was curious, very lively guy. But uh, I mean, I, I, I was trying to explain to these guys that uh, I'd like to work in fine arts. But then you had this guy who was hoping to stop working in the factory to to gain more muscles. I mean, how crazy is that? <laughs> so it's it kind of balanced things. There's another level of disconnect in an entirely different way in that part of what brought you to the factory in the first place was the fact that your father worked there, but he, he didn't walk on the, he didn't work on the floor. I mean, occasionally you would see him sort of walking by. Yeah, he would, uh, no, cause he was a, a draftsman, technical draftsman, but uh, sometimes he would do other stuff cause he, he was very curious to try and uh, he's the one who was taking care of the the sound, the, the, the decibel to make sure that, uh, so they would have to every year to take uh, measurements of that. The noise levels. Yeah, right. So noise level. And, um, he, he, he was, uh, so just, I remember he was telling me that when I was younger and uh, the day I saw him finally uh, there, uh, he was taking the measurement for that. I thought, oh, you know, that's that machine he showed me once and all that. Uh, I didn't expect to, um, I didn't plan to put my father uh, so much in the book. Uh, for me, the main subject was really the factory and the people that are in that factory, just like going into a different country where uh, for me, that country was the factory. And, um, it helped, it had, I had all the ingredients of a traveling book, basically. You go in a, some weird place and then uh, you have different, uh, perspective and and um, sceneries to do or the machine and the smokes and the pipes so that was a lot of fun to draw and um, so yeah I realized that uh, well okay if I go in that factory it's because my father worked there so I had to explain the situation with my father the relation with my father and then he came he came throughout the book basically every like 15 20 page I would look for him. I, <laughs> I, I found him. I'd go to his place and all that. And uh, I realized that it was actually quite interesting narratively to explain my relation with him. And at the end, uh, I thought, yeah, something is missing. And then with my publisher, I said, I said, I'd like to, you know, finish with my father when he, did, when he died a few years ago. And that was kind of the end of it. 
and my brother was there, and then it just it, it just made sense. But uh, it was not planned. And when um, I think of the book now, I, even the main character is my father, uh, and uh, the the factory is there. So yeah, you never know. You start with a book, and uh, it it kind of goes in a bit different direction than I thought. What's really interesting about your father in the first probably three quarters of the book, I, I suppose, is, um, as you said, there are moments when you go to his apartment and, and visit him and he basically sort of lectures at you. But throughout most of the book, he's kind of a ghost. Yeah. He's this um, character in, in the periphery that, you know, you think maybe you see walking by, but you're not sure it's him. Yeah. And you have that expression, um searching for the father or looking for the father. So in France, it is chercher le père. And uh, I have literally that situation where I think I see him. I kind of run in the factory and I say, uh, you know, dad, <laughs> dad. So I'm running after that ghost, basically, which is a very good description of my relation with him because, uh, you know, it's never been really there. And then when he was there, you were never really in in front of someone you can just have a normal conversation always so it, that's it was that kind of guy you know drawn and quarterly had described it as your most personal book and and i think that's right but it, it's an it's a funny thing to say about somebody who has you know to some degree all the travel logs were about you and your family and your travels but but this is different. And I don't know if it's just the nature of your relationship with your father or the way that you told it, but this does feel deeply personal in a way that maybe the other books weren't. In the other books, uh, I, I don't talk. I talk about the children because it's funny. And that's it. I don't really go into personal stuff. Uh, I don't really like to read books that are too personal because I feel like hmm, I shouldn't be reading this. I have that reading very quickly so uh, I don't feel at ease with books like that so I don't do books like that basically um, my traveling books even though back in in Burma or Jerusalem we had some problems in, in, in all couples can have I'm not gonna put that in, in in a book I mean that's that's there's no point and that's no sense and this one is different maybe because of the age <laughs> I'm 55 now so um, I guess I wanted to talk to my father uh, without, I think, without admitting it at first. But once the book is finished, I realized that, like I was saying, well, maybe he's the main character after all. And the fact that he died a few years before, I was thinking, you know, what a, what a strange relation I had with my father. At the end of it, narratively, it was making sense. Otherwise, I wouldn't have put that into in, in, in the book yet. You get to see that young me at 17 and uh, a bit of his relation with his friend's family and father. So I thought, yeah, that that, that makes a book. That's okay. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I don't know if I necessarily say he's the main character. I mean, you know, you very much are in that you're the kind of the force that drives the whole thing, but he's the heart of the book. Yeah, right. In the process of writing about writing this book and writing about him, and going through and re-remembering these things, do you feel like you gained a better insight into your relationship with him? Yes and no. I've explained uh, maybe more clearly to myself what, because uh, I had to draw and I had to, to make him do these lectures. So it's a bit more clear the, the kind of guy he was for me. Um, in the ending, uh, it was uh, very moving to do it, um, and uh, I'm glad I did it like that. I I think I, I I've done it too. Because my father died so like uh, four years ago, and I don't think I would have done it while he's still um, alive. Yeah, I think maybe that book uh, was possible to do because uh, that was that was over with my father. And I said, well, okay, now I can talk a bit about him. Yeah. It's, it's there's all these things together. Yeah. In a certain sense, was his dying a catalyst for you wanting to sit down and write the book? Well, my relation was so distant that uh, well, I was no, not really. I don't think so. It just it came in my mind like yeah, now that uh, he's away, I can. I, 
it's not an homage because the way I describe it, it's not very positive, but uh, in my mind and for my family, it is a little bit, I think, like, well, you know, my father, he was a special guy, but he was like that. And, uh, yeah, just to draw him, that was, that was a bit of a, a catharsis to, <laughs> and to show it to my, to my sisters and, uh, and my, my father, my, my brother. And, uh, and he said, yeah, it's like, <laughs> he looks exactly like that. What were his feelings about the career path you chose? I mean, in a certain sense, were they similar to the reactions that you got from the guys on the floor in that it just, wanting to pursue this was just completely foreign to him? Well, I had the chance to be the the fourth uh, children. Uh, the first one had a lot of problem and he divorced and he was out of the house when I had to make decision about going in an art school because he wouldn't, he wouldn't have go for that. I mean, he would have, uh, just like he did with my father, my father wanted to do some some study. Then he said, "You're not going to do that." So it was a big fight. Um, so I would have, I, I probably I would have fight with him. And uh, but uh, since I was the fourth one, I, I didn't have to go through that. So it was much easier. Yeah. And what do you think about my career? Um, well, frankly, I have to say I don't know because uh, to connect with him and have a just normal conversation was. It's just really strange, and I would just give up and and try to put few things like uh, you know uh, I'm you know everything. At the end of the, of of the day, I would be with him, and I was thinking. Yeah, I would say briefly, well, Dad, I've been I've been in France, and uh, it's going all fine. You know, I'm publishing books, and he would pause and say, Oh yeah, and then uh, oh good, 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 and. Uh, not much would come of that, you know, like these father. Uh, the funny thing is, um, after that book, I had uh, a few guys who uh, said, I've worked in a factory. And one guy said, I worked in a factory in, uh, for 41 years. And uh, I was working with your father for many, many years. And uh, he said, you know, if you want to talk about that uh, and have a few uh, a few insights about your father, you know, here's my phone number. I phoned him the day after and we had the two hours of a, of a good conversation. It was interesting. So I said, well, how was he like? So uh, it's funny because I have to ask a, um, a strange guy, uh, a, a stranger guy, how was my father at work? So I had all sorts of questions. I took notes and then I phoned my brothers and sisters. I said, you know, that is this and this. So he was actually talking about, he said, he was talking about you guys, the, the families, the, the children. He, and I said, oh, really? Wow. Because uh, <laughs> I have to. <laughs> It's a short and small, but as I'm thinking back on the book, perhaps the most profound moment of the book for me is when you go visit him in the office and you realize that that's the last and you know maybe only time that you're going to be in his office. So you need to really soak it in and get a visual of this place where he spends all his time. I and mean, that was a really, especially, you know, now as we're talking about memory, that was an incredibly important moment for the book. Yeah, well, that's true. Yeah, totally. I agree with you. I'm glad you picked that up um, because you're there, you're 17 and uh, that's it. I mean, that's the only time I saw where my father was working. And uh, I don't know, I think of my my son is 17 and, you know, he comes to the studio. He's been there many, many times. Uh, it's so different. I did that book a bit too because um, my my son is 17 and I look at him and says, oh, what was I doing at that time? And uh, I, 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 I wanted to do the book and call it At Your Age, uh, Three Dots, and then give it to him and says, you know, At Your Age, I was working at the factory. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, of course that title didn't work and um just to you know just to sh to tell him that you know I, I was working when I was your age which is such a, an old father thing to say and it was yeah it was as a part of the of the start of the book yeah to, to when I was seeing my son and saying you know what was I doing at that time 